Good evening, everyone. What a great day. What a great night. Thank you all for being here. Woo! My name is Colleen Kennedy. I'm the executive director of the Canadian Club. I'm so pleased to be hosting this evening's event, this great event with these smart, smart friends of ours. Yeah. But first... <laughs> Let me start by acknowledging the land that we're meeting on. For centuries, this territory has been the traditional home of many First Nations, the most recent being the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation, and we are grateful for the opportunity to gather and learn on this land. So, so we thought that the words uncut and uncensored that we used was really, really different for the Canadian Club, and we're glad that you came out. It's sold out, so thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us today. Our club is proud of the range of events we hold. They reflect our commitment to offering diverse topics and speakers in fun, electric and vibrant atmosphere, and I really think that we've captured this here. I hope everyone has a drink and some food. So, electric and vibrant is something that also describes the Hurly Burly podcast. Bombastic, irreverent, and enlightening, we hope. <laughs> Podcasts are commonplace now, but the Hurly Burly podcast is as relevant and timely as ever. As relevant and timely as podcasts should be, and we are grateful to have the friends like this at our podium. But before I introduce them, let me thank the Insur Insurance Bureau of Canada for being our sponsor today. Thank you. Yeah. We tr appreciate your support and what it brings to live discussions. We think that live discussions are more important than ever in this t time and age of polarized discourse. So we're glad that we can all come together, share a drink, and discuss some really important issues. So please feel free to tweet or post about tonight's events. We have social handles on the table if you want to tag some of our speakers or the club. We'd love to hear from you. So now, on with the podcast. So the Hurly Burly podcast is the destination for, might I say, hip and in the know facts who want a more meaningful and raw analysis of election 43. We are lucky to be able to hear and see them live. So let's hope these dialed in politicos make some bold predictions and uh, share some interesting insights with us tonight about what might happen on Monday. Who wants to know? Everybody needs to know. <laughs> Right. So David Hurley, Jenny Byrne, and Scott Reed bring a ton of expertise and experience in political strategy, political campaigning, uh, to their fresh, no holds barred conversations and stories. So, uh, no, <laughs> we have high expectations. So, first off, David Hurley is the owner of the Gandalf Group. He's been around liberal politics for a while. I don't know. <laughs> 100 years. <laughs> The Hurley Burley was created as a platform for honest talk and respectful debate. So starting in 2017, guests such as David Axelrod, Robbie Robertson, Thomas Frank have gone head to head with David about politics and culture. And we're sure glad for that. So Jenny Byrne is a conservative strategist who served as director of issues management for Prime Minister St Stephen Harper. She was also his deputy chief of staff. Jenny was the, na uh, the Conservative Party national campaign manager in 2011 and 2015. And 11 was a lot more fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and last year she was a key player in the Conservative provincial uh, campaign. So, <laughs> it's no holds barred. But in the so Scott Reed is a senior strategic communications professional. 13 years ago, he helped found Festic Reed. It develops public affairs and uh, communication strategies and services for C-level executives. He's one of the country's best known political commentators from CTV, Globe and Mail, Star Globe, he seems to be everywhere. And he also served, by the way, as the communications director for Prime Minister Paul Martin. So a great panel with us. And after their discussion, we're gonna open the floor to questions. So 
make sure you start thinking about those questions. Um, and we'll be joined by two more wise and uh, experienced commentators who have appeared on the Hurley Burley campaign strategy uh, advertising episodes. Dennis Matthews is Vice President in Marketing and Communications at Enterprise Canada, which is a strategic communications firm in Toronto. Dennis has a wealth of experience in the public and private sector, including serving as day one staff member in the office of Prime Minister Stephen Harper. And also joining us is David Rosenberg. Woo! Woo! He is the Chief Creative Officer at Ben Simon Byrne. Trained as a writer, David has worked with a multitude of top-notch brands, and he also created liberal political advertising both federally and provincially, including 2015's Federal Liberal Campaign. Sorry, Denny. So, <laughs> audience, do not forget to formulate your questions for Q&A session. Commentators, the gloves are off. Over to you. Woo! I actually, Scott, up until this moment, did not know that Dennis was a day one employee of Stephen Harper. Did he I happen did to trip you as you were passing in the doorway, heading out of Langemer or something like that? that no, it affected my opinion of him, though, you. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> <laughs> Asshole. <laughs> All right, I got a, a few notes here because I want to make sure that we get this uh, right. I want to, my name is David Hurley host of the Hurley Burley. I want to first thank the Canadian Club for having this event. They came to us. They cold called us and said, we'd like to do something with your podcast and do this event. And it's really exciting uh, for us to do it. And we're thrilled. So thank you, Colleen, and thank you to the Canadian Club for doing this. Um, I want to also thank the Insurance Bureau of Canada for supporting this event. I want to really thank Hawkins Cheesies yeah. for supporting this event. From Everybody Melbourne. knows that the Hawkins Cheesy is the best cheesy in the world, perhaps the only <laughs> cheesy that can call itself a cheesy uh, in the world. And so Hawkins has graciously provided and help yourself cheesies for everybody here. A little shout out to the Coca-Cola company who heard me mention on a podcast that I like to drink rum and Coke and they sent me Coke but no fucking rum. Anyway. <laughs> There's uh, four people here that this podcast would not exist without, and I want to just quickly mention them. That is uh, Jill Engelman, Michael Spitali, David Rosenberg, and Jody Calero, yeah. um, who have been instrumental to the creation and support of this project uh, throughout. Um, I want to uh, thank, obviously, Jenny and Scott, who made this podcast something completely different than it was and has turned it into... Uh, a bit of a thing and a buzzworthy event in this election campaign and and that's really on them and lastly I want to thank Ted and the folks at the pilot for having us here to this uh, historic event so with that over with thank you <laughs> this is not a historic event this is an event in a historic historic uh, it's something it's historic. a good historic <laughs> thank you the it's a thank Roman like you. event thank you to Ted and the pilot um, anyway so um, we're down to the short strokes. We are joined by uh, Jenny and Scott. Uh, Jenny Byrne, I've really gotten to know through doing this podcast, and what a delight it has been to get to know you. She's whip smart, and she's funny and fun to be around, and she takes no shit from Reed, which is um, her best feature on this podcast. Scott... I'm dead. These two people both had the best laughs in the world, right? <laughs> Listen to that. Scott, Scott Reed um, has been uh, my friend for a very, very long time. I think that he's a bit of a revelation to a lot of people through oh, this yeah. podcast because many of you only know Scott through his very formal appearances on CTV or the smaller networks, cable channels that have him on. And... <laughs> uh, <laughs> you may occasionally find him writing in the Huffington Post, for example. And, um, so I feel like in this podcast, a little secret that some of us who are friends of Scott's have known all this time, and that's how freaking funny this guy is. Jenny and I have good senses of humor. Scott has professional quality comedy yeah, at his disposal. Right. Yeah. 
Let's, let's start by diminishing expectations. Yeah. Right start. I'm, I'm just going to, and this may be something you could think of for questions. I'm just going to say one thing. One time in a bar, <laughs> when he was off on one of his outrageous tangents, I said to Scott, I said, <laughs> where do you come up with all this fucking shit? And he said, here's the scary thing. I only say 10% of it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, 90 would put you in prison. So, <laughs> so uh, let's, start, let's start off. Um, all of us have been in tight elections, yep. uh, elections that came down to the wire. Um, and um, we've played different roles in those things. So, Scott, maybe I could start off with, with you. You have been on the plane with the leader in an election that was this close and coming down to the wire. What's that like? Um, well, let me start by just, for everybody, and don't mean to be obnoxious, but just by defining the plane means you're in the air, on the road with the prime minister, as opposed to, or the leader, as opposed to being back at central headquarters, right? So that's a distinction. And doing, I've been doing the real work on election day. That's right. <laughs> Actually, it is right. Because, <laughs> like, it really is right. Because often on election day, there's about six hours you're like, well, what do I do with myself, right? And the answer to that question is usually drink. Um, <laughs> So, um, so I think the thing that most people would be most surprised about is that in that last 48 hours on close elections, and we were in two close elections where David and we've been in a couple of more than a couple of elections together, but um, in 2004, 2006, both were uh, close elections. Um, but it, it was not; it was very tense because of the circumstance, it was not tense because we did not know the outcome. We knew the outcome. So in 2004, we're watching people on television talk all day long about how it's incalculably close and impossible to call. But David had told us already, because David didn't talk about himself, David is the best pollster in Canada, okay? The best, okay? And I'm not just saying that because of his hair, <laughs> although it contributes mightily to his success. Um, Samson. But David is disciplined, he's professional, he's rigorous, he's focused, and most of all, most, 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 most of all, he's honest. And that's what really matters in an election campaign, because he's honest about what the numbers are <clears throat> and what the numbers aren't. And so in 2004, we're watching television telling us that it's a toss-up, and David is like, we won. We won, like we fucking won, okay? So we have to prepare for how we're gonna manage this situation, because we won, but it's a minority, so we're gonna have to figure it out, we gotta recalculate it, haven't had a minority government for a long time in Canada, do we reach out to Hugh Siegel, who had one in uh, Ontario a few years ago, all that kind of stuff, right? But we've won, 2006, we've lost. So prepare for a different thing. Same scenario, people are saying, well, it's too close to cost, we know. So the first and most important thing I wanna impress on people is that I don't know what people in the various campaigns right now, and I hope we pick up on this, because I think it's interesting that Shear spent all day long saying, our internals say we're winning. Okay. Because I don't think he's lying. Like, I don't think he's, I don't think he's trying to spin us. You know, I mean, you're jumping. I know, you're but <laughs> I want to come back to that, because... What are you doing on the plane today? If you're on the plane today, what are you doing? So what I'm doing is this. You're drinking. I that for is for sure. sure. When did you and Festruck start drinking in the morning? At 7.30 a.m. <laughs> But you it's think five I'm clock somewhere. No, but you think that's a joke. But in 2004, <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> Festuck is here and he can back me up. So in 2004, we're going to win the election campaign. And so what happens is on the plane physically, Scott and I are sitting in the first row behind the prime minister and his wife. And we decide that a great way to demonstrate momentum and to really push this ball over the line is to go from coast to coast. We start in Newfoundland at the beginning of the morning, pre-morning, and we're going to fly all the way and end the day in Vancouver. He's going to dip his feet in both his feet. I know it's not nice to think about Palmer's feet. We're going to dip <laughs> in both oceans. We go ocean to ocean. And Scott and I are like, listen, <laughs> if we're going to work 24 hours in this day, we're going to fucking drink for 24 <laughs> hours in this day. And the these, these two incredible 
uh, women who worked on our plane, like, they would like, just bring us beer every time Scott and I got on the plane. Didn't matter what time it was. But like, now it's like 7 o'clock in the morning. They bring us beer. And so we're sitting there, and we're like drinking beer. And the prime minister hears us cracking open beer. And he's yeah. like, this isn't why they're drinking beer. <laughs> You're supposed to be writing their, your speech. He's writing my speech. And then we're like, and then, and, but the truth is, writing a speech isn't that hard. We've written the speech already. So we can plug in a couple of different lines. So you hear, nice to be in Miss Saga, nice to be in Halifax, nice to be in Chester, right? <laughs> but like, we're like, we're like, yeah, I write that. And then we start writing fake lines for a speech, right? Like sort of like, you know, go fuck yourself, San Diego kind of lines, right? We're laughing and we're drinking beer. And he's like, why are they laughing? He's like getting mad. He's like turning back around, you know, all that stuff. And then you would land on the ground and it's one o'clock and we're in Manitoba and we're trashed. And people are like, well, we are obviously well and truly fucked. If you guys are sideways at one o'clock in the afternoon, we're like, no, Hurley says we're gonna win. We just like to drink beer all day long. So that's what it's like to be on the last day when you're winning. Wow. You must so have had the same experience in. You, that's uh, what you do in headquarters. When you do in headquarters, when you're pulling out the boat, uh, you drink all day. Even even when when. But by the way, I was, I asked for a rum and coke, and I could I get it whenever <laughs> we get a chance. Thank you. I think he might need a double. No. There we go. Okay, right Jenny. On. You. No, you, you I'll, have I'll be, I'll be, I'll be honest. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll take, I'll take a quarter of the time that uh, Scott just. Sorry, yeah. That's... Probably because even being on a winning campaign for the Conservatives, we weren't drinking beer at 7:30 a.m. Wow. Who wants to be a conservative? <laughs> <laughs> um, I. Uh, yeah, so it, so not being a comms person, being a ground person. <laughs> being uh, a real person. <laughs> being a person that actually delivers votes and all that kind of... Yeah, that's fair. Uh, so uh, I, I, I will say that 2011, we knew we were winning. 2015, I can say that for the most part, most of us knew we weren't winning. Uh, 2011 was a much more fun campaign to be, to be part of. Uh, that campaign, actually, I, I uh, oversaw things from Calgary. We had a little, uh, little war room set up. I could watch the voter ID numbers. I, was, I put some uh, crest white strips on my teeth in the morning, sat in my pajamas, listened to the Prime Minister talk to uh, George W. Bush, who thanked him. Steve, it's a good one. You're going to win this election today. <laughs> Steve. Uh, but, uh, I, yeah, so... so on election day, there's actually nothing much more that can uh, happen at this point. Are you uh, in headquarters? Uh, no, in, in 2011, I was at a, our war room in the Hyatt getting my teeth bleached. Right. In yeah. 2015, I was at HQ. Right. Um, with staff who were coming up to me going, you know, there's a possibility I think we might not win today. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> slight... <laughs> The, the Liberals winning 32 out of 32 Why are you there? Atlanta, what's left Canada. to do? What's yeah. left to do? Yeah. Why are you there? Well, what's left to do is you're dealing with uh, uh, people on the ground. So you're dealing with uh, our people that are getting their votes out. So, for example, if you're centralizing your voter, or your voter ID and your GOTV, uh, you're watching your voters actually go out and vote. So you're watching people based on your phones or based on computer. Uh, they are actually, you're seeing if they go and vote. So... If someone goes and votes, right. someone is marking it on what we call a bingo sheet, and that's being then communicated back to us in the war room. So we know that if in Cumberland, Colchester, in Nova Scotia, that we're not getting our vote out, we can actually turn on the phones and actually put more calls into Cumberland, Colchester, to get them out to, uh, to vote. Which so in 2015, were you freaked out about the fact you weren't getting your vote out, or were you worried about the fact that the vote that was getting out was actually not really your vote? I was a bit of both. Okay. It's an interesting question, by the way. Like right now, yeah. in, this, in this circumstance, where the NDP have gone from, say, 10% to maybe 18% or something like that, almost all of it taken from the Liberal Party, mm -hmm. okay? How do the Liberals ensure they're not pulling new Democrats? They don't, they don't know at this point. There's no way you know. So in 2015, we had record number. When we went uh, into election, into the final weekend of the election, we had more votes identified than any election I've ever been part of. And 
going back from 1997 onwards. The problem is, is even people we identified in June and July of 2015, they were turning on us. They weren't voting for us. Right. So we were getting the vote out, but they weren't necessarily voting for us. And at this point, there's nothing you can do. So at this point, there is no nasty, uh, there is no nasty ad that you can put out that's going to change people. Mm. The only thing you can do is contact the people that you have in your list, in your databases and get them out to vote and hope like pray to fuck that they're still supporting you right okay so you've both been advisors very very senior advisors to um prime ministers who were going down to defeat okay um and and knew it in both cases what kind of what kind of counsel, what are leaders looking for from their senior staff in that circumstance, in the final days? Why don't well, you go, go first? first. <laughs> 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 no, but no, fucking but seriously, <laughs> why don't you go first? <laughs> uh, no, what, uh, you know... It's human nature. Leaders are, are looking at uh, hearing the truth. They want to know how uh, unpopular they are and, and how people are voting against them and that, uh, that we're probably going to lose and uh, 100 of their closest friends and family are, uh, uh, are going uh, to be out of jobs. So, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, no, I think that it, 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 is a, um, it is very hard in terms of dealing with a whole host of people when you actually realize that um, uh, you're not winning because the responsibility, like they feel a lot of responsibility. Well, and because it's not just, and this will sound very, very glib because everyone's like, oh, you political staffers and what have you. And so I know how this sounds in saying it out loud, but when you're in government, you guys know there are like hundreds of people who are getting a paycheck based on working for cabinet ministers or MPs. They're MPs themselves. And you're sitting there t knowing that you're about to go down into, in defeat. And not only is, you're, are you dealing with the prime minister, the leader, who is publicly going to have to fucking take it on the chin and, and, and deal with it, but you're also looking at people that have to pay their mortgages and they might you know, have, have small kids and what have you, and all these people are going to be uh, out of jobs. And it's a very, um, it's, it's, it's a very, it, it's not a fun place to be, but it, at this point, when you're three days away from an election campaign, you're not trying to, let, like, you know. Are you sort like, of a support group for it? Kind of, because at this point, you know. Like, most campaign managers, like, you know. Like, three days in, you know. Good or bad, you know. There's been very few campaigns. Well, sometimes in the provincial, I knew three days in, literally three days in. <laughs> <coughs> not three days out, no, three days in. No, um, well, unless, of, <laughs> unless, of course, unless, of course, you're Tim Hudak and you think election night, you're still winning. Um, but uh, And now a word from our sponsor, the Ontario yeah. Real Estate Association. <laughs> yeah. Don't shit for you eat. <laughs> <laughs> but at this, at this point, uh, at this point, and David, I would like to hear you, you talk about this. At this point, you know, you know at three days left to go uh, before election day happens, uh, there's only been one, a, a by-election in Brandon, Manitoba in uh, the, the fall of 2013 that I li literally, election day, as the polls closed, I had no clue. That was the only election that I have ever managed, like, at a riding level or a national level that I did not know. So, but you have three days of people pulling to get their vote out in the on the ground. You have uh, a skeleton staff at, in, in, uh, in the war room, and then you have the leader and his entourage, and you're trying to keep everyone buoyed and, and, and trying to- And working. And working, uh, but also not trying to be like, hey, it's, we're gonna win a majority. Be awesome, be, off, be honest, those committee rooms, in the dying days of losing campaign, are the most depressing places. To They're horrible. Be, All right. They're horrible. Oh. And and we 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 conservatives don't drink as much as you liberals, so we weren't. Oh my God! I would have done anything to transport right. myself out of the committee rooms last uh, June. It was gruesome. Right. Um, yeah. So uh, you, on the plane with a guy that's losing and knows it, he'd stopped asking me for the polling numbers anymore. Right. Didn't want to know. Didn't yeah. Right. 
And uh, other than getting drunk, what are you doing to support them in there? <laughs> well, that was for sure my major contribution. Um, uh, Festchuk and I were talking about this tonight. Scott's here, and we were chatting about this very thing earlier because uh, we were reminiscing about um, the end of 2006. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, so um, one of the things, so first of all, the first thing I want to say actually is exactly what you said. I just want to reinforce it. Um, prime ministers feel the burden, ain't eh? the leaders feel the burden of all the people whose paychecks and lives and livelihoods rely upon them, right? So people love to be cynical about politicians and say, you know, they're all in it for themselves and all this kind of horrible stuff. Um, but those people spend that last three, four days, and it, it's about the last three, four days when you finally come to Jesus and realize when you're losing that you're losing, right? Um, uh, they spend those three, four days thinking about all of the scars that will uh, be worn by others um, on their behalf. And so they, they, they take, take that hard. Um, my, my 2006 story is, you know, I mean, uh, Paul Martin was a punishing guy to write speeches for, right? Just because he never read them. No. <laughs> That's mean. That's so mean. You're so mean. He read them. Um, he just didn't like them. <laughs> he just didn't like what Scott Feshuk and Scott Reed wrote for him. <laughs> if he really found some guy named Roger who would write a speech, he would have enjoyed it, right? He was like, what's with these Scott people? Um, no, but he was, he was really severe. Uh, Paul was always tough on speech writers, right? And he was always like, oh, you know, we should do it this way. We need to restructure it. We need to stand here for 77 hours and rewrite speeches. And it was always a process with him. Like, it was a huge process with him. I see Terry O'Leary. She's laughing. Like, it's like it was a monster <laughs> process with Paul, okay, getting a speech out the door because he wanted to spend hours and hours and hours sweating every syllable and every word. And Scott Fesha and I lived that for a long time. And on the night of the 2006 election, um, well, during the day, Scott and I, predictably, uh, ordered a, a big bucket of Heineken to our hotel room. And <laughs> sat there and wrote the speech that we didn't want to write, but we knew we had to write. And so we wrote that speech. And then we carried it down to him in, in his hotel room, and we gave it to him. And the remarkable thing about that night and that moment is that Paul took a pen out. He always had a... Uh, felt mark marker pen and uh, he took it out and he crossed out two things he said change this change that and they gave it back to us like, there were no long revisions there was no argument about structure there was no nothing it was like that's it let's do it and it wasn't a lack of care and it wasn't uh, a glibness it was just like let's get this fucking thing over with yeah. okay so it's been um, sorry I know no, that's the, well that's that's what it's like that is what it's like um, so on to this current election campaign, there's been, um, some activity this week. Um, there have been, the parties have been still been trying to move some votes this week. Andrew Scheer has been talking about winning a majority government, uh, or winning for sure that he's going to win. He's been very aggressively putting that out, sometimes majority, sometimes not, but he's insisting he's going to win. The Liberals trotted out an endorsement from no less than Barack Obama this week. Um, and the NDP are trying to clean up their messaging about coalition this week. Um, I want to uh, ask you guys two things. One, what do you think about what the parties have been doing so far this week? What do you think about Shear's majority talk? What do you think about the Obama endorsement? And are there any tactical plays left? Or is this thing literally now just in the hands of the gods? Or are there any, is there anything left people can do? Jenny, you go first. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, well... Otherwise, you might not get it. <laughs> <laughs> Pour another rub into me. I'll talk <laughs> until the sun comes up. Well, I think uh, I, I actually want to start by saying something that has not happened uh, this campaign, uh, and throw back to you guys uh, is that what I have been surprised at is I woke up on all three of the debates where all the leaders participated in, expecting what you guys always did to us, and that is. Uh, basically put out a debate to stabilizer and it it was soul crushing and awful and I was waiting for you know the young pups at the our war room to be able to have to deal with that and it didn't happen this week I was waiting for ads about 
you know, American citizenship and same-sex marriage, and I thought I'd wake up on Tuesday morning, and when I came with my coffee to do the hurly-burly, you guys would be like, you know, make fun of the conservatives and what have you, <laughs> and there is nothing. So I am very disappointed in the liberals for not actually... Uh, for not actually like running in You must be very of, disappointed that yeah, they're not be. running as good a campaign I'm as very, you wish that they were. Imagine how we yeah. feel. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, I, I, think there's, I think there's two answers to your question. I mean, one of which is um, very trapped by language around sunny ways and not running uh, negative advertising. I think right. they feel very, very constrained by that. But I think over the course of our conversations over this campaign, I, I've become convinced of something that I wasn't convinced of at the time. And I think that the whole brown face, black face incident has actually um, discombobulated the Liberal campaign much more than I thought. Like, do, you think, do you think the campaign or the Prime Minister? I think the campaign. Maybe the Prime Minister. I can't judge that. But I think that they are not running the campaign they intended to run. And I don't know that they were able to figure out a second one, a plan B. But I think they had a campaign plan starting off, and you could see it in the first week with the attacks on the yeah. conservative candidates. I think they had a campaign plan that was built around moral high ground, and it was pulled out from under them on the blackface, brownface incident. Yeah, I agree with all that. Um, I agree with that really strongly. I think um, I agree with both points. Um, and by the way, I'm not certain that they couldn't have still done those ads, and I wish they were doing those ads. So we'll see what happens on um, Monday night. Maybe they'll be triumphant, and that'll be that. Um, my guess is that we'll end up in a tight ma minority situation, and we'll talk about predictions later. Um, but, um, I, you know, I, I think the answer to your original question is there's lots of cards you can still play in these last few days. I mean, I know that because I lived through that, because I, I sat in... Um, uh, uh, an airport hangar and listen to you tell me in 2004 we're going to put um, the following um, plays into action and we did and it helped us and we increased but our that was total. that was earlier than the Friday before the campaign but not like that your, much earlier your, not your, that much earlier in 2000 gun. well let me put it oh, okay well I'll take up the challenge of the Friday before the campaign 2006 we were at 85 seats and we ended up with 106 seats. And that was because we put one ad on the air. And we talked about it before on the podcast yeah. about abortion. Um, put an ad on the air that laid out the logic case about how electing Harper would put a woman's right to choose at risk. Right. Pretty good, hard-hitting ad. We didn't tell the media it existed. And um, not even sure we told Paul it existed. And but No. Um, <laughs> and I don't think he would have liked it. I don't think he would have no, liked he it would at not. all. And... Um, and we put it up there, we put 700 GRPs behind it, and it went through the conservative female vote like acid. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. It absolutely corroded them. And so I, I think there are lots of things you can do in the final days, and we're not in the absolute final days. So there are still going to be uh, moves that will be made by uh, various campaigns. Um, I've not been blown away by any of the moves that have been made by any of the campaigns so far, although I'm particularly underimpressed by the NDP campaign, because they're surging, and I've been a fr I've been a friend. Man, they have no money. You've yeah, never but they're worked not in a campaign. Like that. Okay, well that's You've fair. Never, like none of us have ever worked in a campaign. They, they must be the most frustrated people in the world, because Dennis and David and I were talking about this on the podcast. That's the, interesting. On the ad podcast today, if they that bump that they got, bump surge, whatever you want to call it, that they got out of the debates and that whole thing, if it had been one of our parties that that had happened to, we had had so much resources to pour behind that. Pay we would have had ads pushing it. that out. All okay. that stuff. But, but they not, have okay, no but, money. But guys, it's actually not that much of a surge. They're up they're up pot like potentially at the high watermark of where they ended the last campaign. That is not momentum. That is just kind of getting where they started the campaign. Well, it's eating some liberal seeds, so it's, uh, it's having an effect. It the, could have the been more if they'd had more to put behind it, though, right? I don't know if it was. Like, I, I, it's Who knows? For us to, it, it's easy for us to say, but they're essentially getting wiped out in Quebec. So like, yeah. even, though, even though they're sitting at 20%, which is what they got in the last election, we're all thinking it's momentum because they started so low and because they're somewhat eating the... Uh, Green Party's lunch, because Elizabeth May has completely shit the bed in terms of, like, running this campaign, that that we think it's momentum, and it's just them actually holding their own. And not but, even that, because they could end up with less seats, because the 12 current seats they have in Quebec, they probably are winning at this point. So, um, 
I, on the Quebec thing, to your point, David, about well, they could probably be doing, if they had the resources, they could do something. But here's one thing they didn't need to do that they did, that I thought was lame, as an example, right. in this past couple of days. Taking Olivia Chow to Quebec and saying, this is a momentum builder, because in 2011, Jack Layton became Bon Jacques in the last few days, and so we're going to haul out Olivia Chow and try to reconjure that. I thought that was a lame, fully English media. If, if anything, it, it was only an English media play. And it really, really, really smelled weak to me. So I did not think that was. I not like they, they have a lot of Quebec icons in their part. I understand. But like, your point was, they don't have a lot of paid media resources they can haul in. That's fine. But their earned media effort has not been Cracker Jack in the last handful of days. Right, including the Christmas on the, uh, on the coalition thing. Right. Jenny, Obama's endorsement, inappropriate or not? Uh, yeah, sure. On the record, I would say inappropriate, it doesn't matter, but obviously it does. Uh, you know, Trudeau has tried to. <laughs> <laughs> You're technically on the record. <laughs> <laughs> it's a podcast. Trudeau, you know, Trudeau has tried to style his whole leadership around Barack Obama, including looking like him. Oh, <laughs> baby. Okay. That's a burn. <laughs> the burn burn. Mine of the night, it will not be caught. <laughs> <laughs> oh my. All right. So, <laughs> I got a lot of jokes I want to tell, but I cannot tell any of them. <laughs> All right. Well, you know what? It is, uh, time flies when you're laughing like that. We are at our predictions stage. Uh oh. All right. Who wants to go first? Oh, I'm not giving a prediction tonight. Oh, yes, you are. Oh, no, I am. Come on. Oh, yes, you are. Wait a second. It was on the agenda I sent to you, and I've got the response here. Got the response. <laughs> it says, works for me. <laughs> <laughs> but by that, I meant except the seventh topic. We were like... No, no, come on, do it. I... Uh, I think it's going to be a close one. I think. Oh, oh. Jesus Christ! <laughs> you know, after the 2004 election, Daryl Bricker sent out an internal memo to his staff at Ipsos Reid. That oh, let's give it. We may have got the government wrong, but we got it right that it was a minority. <laughs> I promise you, I promise I will send you guys my predictions on Sunday, and so you can like... Oh, is that good enough for the crowd? I don't think is so. Is that good enough I for don't the think crowd? So. Hey, I think Jenny's family wants to know her prediction. <laughs> yeah! Her mom is cheery. <laughs> David, not Jenny. Yeah, she's Come on, give us a prediction. No, I'm, I've already said, I'll tell you guys on Sunday. All right. Come on, let's hear yours. You're a hard ass, man. Holy moly, no wonder you work for Harper. <laughs> All right. I got some paper here. I've been doing some figuring. Deciphering. And some calculations, some astrological charts and all that sort of stuff. And I uh, predict the fall. How long did it take you to find out how many writings there are? Well, I know nothing <laughs> about politics, as this podcast has demonstrated, right? I couldn't believe. Sylvia presents his ringtone. Recognize it anywhere. Oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, Mission Impossible, that's quite an omen. Um, so I think the following. I think the Liberals will win 139 seats. <laughs> <laughs> that was, that was my stepmom, by the way. disagrees. And her fault. The crowd was Jenny's family. <laughs> I think the Conservatives will win 123 seats, which I think you should be pretty fucking happy to get. <laughs> with a guy like that as your leader, keepers, keepers. <laughs> the New Democrats are going to get 36, which is unbelievable. I mean, let's just for one second, can we pause? 
and say that we all started the podcast by saying that Jagmeet Singh was a giant disaster, the NDP were going to be a train wreck, they were going to be wiped out of party status, and they're awful, and we turn out to be awful. They have run a good campaign, he has been a good campaigner, and we were wrong, and he has been dynamite, eh? Yeah. No. I mean, seriously, like, he has owned us. No. I said, the Greens are going to get six. I told this to my son earlier tonight. He says, where the fuck do you get six seats for the Greens? I don't think the Greens even have themselves winning six. I know. <laughs> I'm not good at this. I'm not a ground game guy. <laughs> and I think the Bloc are going to get 43, and I'm really, really, really terrified that that's an underestimate because I think that the Bloc, I think the NDP... Uh, thing is stopped. I don't know that the block thing is stopped, and I don't know where it stops. So I don't know that 43 is the top of their horizon. But that's mo those are my predictions, so it's a liberal minority. Um, liberals, 141. We're pretty close. Um, conservatives, 123. NDP, 20. Greens, 3. Block, 42. Um, Wait. You guys both have the block very high. Yeah. Jenny, give your prediction. You're the better than both. So, <laughs> <laughs> my rationale, my rationale. The conservatives get 336 <laughs> seats <laughs> and fuck them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know much about Quebec and I don't know much about BC. Michelle Cadario has been telling me what I know about BC. Um, <laughs> Quebec, I know you don't need a ground game, so the fact that the block are taking off, that could easily just be reflected in, um, in the seat count. But the thing that I'm most relying on for this prediction is the fact that the pollsters that I most trust in this election campaign are... Name them. Uh, uh, Frank Graves at Ecos uh, Research, Greg Lyle at, in <laughs> Greg Lyle at Innovative Research, and uh, Nick Nanos, uh, primarily because those are the people using uh, telephone to do, their, to do their polling, and they are all saying that the Liberals are winning Ontario, and I don't think the Conservatives can win this election if they don't win Ontario. I don't see how they can get a plurality of seats Makes if sense. they don't win the most seats in Ontario, and the pollsters I trust are saying that's not going to happen. So, okay. liberal, li small, liberal, plurality. Why? Okay, I have a question to ask both of you then, because you're a pollster and you're a Conservative. <laughs> <laughs> Why is Andrew Scheer going on my radio station, News Talk 1010 this morning. The one you own. I own it. Well, I'd like to think I own it. <laughs> I go on and shoot my mouth off, and I figure that gives me ownership rights. But I, 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 why does he go on News Talk 1010? And why are conservatives that we know and, 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 and like and believe so insistent they are for sure going to win based on their internal polls the plurality of seats because I've heard it over and over for the last well, there few are, days. There are, there are pollsters that are saying that. There are, uh, that's what Ipsos Reid says, that's what Angus Reid says, there's a right. couple other polling organizations that say that, that the two parties are effectively tied in Ontario and that the Conservatives have a turnout advantage based on a more motivated vote uh, on their side. So on the basis of that, those polling organizations predict the Conservatives win Ontario. I just think so it's, it's a wrong. behavioral thing, it's not, a, an, uh, it's not, a, not an empirical thing, it's an assumption that there will be a higher turnout for No, the it's two things. It's two things. One of which is, in, in my view, some of those organizations have panels that lean conservative and historically lean conservative. Ipsos Reid is always more conservative than the reality turns out to be. And uh, so they are showing, whereas the other companies are showing the Liberals with somewhere between a five and ten point lead in Ontario, they're showing the parties tied in Ontario. And then on top of that, they say, and then the Conservatives have a turnout advantage. So that's how they get to the Conservatives winning the most seats in those organizations. Uh, a non-pollster uh, view of that is, uh, I, uh, I am not privy to any of the uh, polling uh, that we have in the uh, Conservative war room, but as a campaign manager uh, on the ground or at a national level, it's not a message that I would want to put out because you want to actually uh, have your uh, supporters okay. uh, feel that there is a need for them to go out and vote. And if they think uh -huh. that... Uh, there is a, uh, it's, it's a foregone conclusion and yeah. you're going to win a lost cause or you, you're so ahead that it doesn't matter. They're yeah. not going to go out and vote. So, uh, I, I am assuming there are people a lot smarter than me that are making decisions, but it's not a message that I would, if I would be pushing out, uh, at this point in the campaign. Excellent. Okay. We're going to move into the next phase of this operation. I'm going to ask Dennis Matthews and David Rosenberg to come up here. <laughs> Woo! Yeah. I think, is this 
Dennis from Enterprise Canada, David from Ben Simon Byrne. These are two people that have faced off against each other in campaigns designing ads for opposing parties, and they have both won a lot of elections with their ever. You guys stay here. Oh, you, you guys are staying here. Oh, no, 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 no. You're not getting off that easy. Scott, we can up. talk about ads, things we don't know anything yeah. about. But Come on up. I thought we were going to the bar. Could I get so, a beer somehow? <laughs> Stella, I'd kill for Stella. <laughs> so for those of you that are confused, the uh, bold guy's name starts with D. And two Davids. <laughs> the two Davids. Um, so you guys, we just taped a podcast today. We recorded a podcast today. It's out this afternoon where we analyzed the last set of ads. So if people want a detailed discussion of the advertising that's been put out by the parties right now, check out the latest edition of the Hurley Birdie that came out this afternoon. But I would look to you guys right now to sort of sum up what you've seen from the parties' communications efforts, all the parties' communications efforts over the, over the campaign, and how you'd summarize what you've seen and if you've seen anything that made an impact on you positively or negatively, and, and maybe all at the end of the day, which parties' advertising helped, helped uh, itself the best. All right, I'll go first. Um, uh, I guess if, if there's one word to describe you know, the entire um, uh, library of, of ads that I've seen from, from every party, it would be disappointing. I talked a little bit ab about this on the podcast this morning. You know, coming at it as a creative guy, you, the first thing you do when you sit down with a brief on a strategy or a message track is you try to um, ask yourself the question, what can I do on this brief that pushes the peanut a little further that hasn't been seen before that is original to this message? And uh, I've seen a lot of competent ads in this campaign, but I haven't seen any ad that breaks through uh, the clutter uh, in a way that makes people go, oh, well, that's interesting. That builds um, a sense of momentum. That makes me think of a candidate in a different way because there hasn't been um, any kind of original, creative, organizing idea in any of the ads. I say original. There's been creative, organized organizing ideas in a few of the ads for different parties. And I'll answer, after Dennis speaks, I'll answer the second part of your question. Um, but I haven't seen anything that was truly breakthrough. Okay. Dennis. Yeah, I, I think one of, the, um, <clears throat> one of the big challenges of this campaign has been lack of public engagement. And you, know, I, you folks have called it the Seinfeld election. There's been other, other descriptions for it. And when you look at campaign advertising, I mean, this is the biggest single expense of a campaign. You know, you'll spend maybe $25 million on your election campaign, and, and half of that will go into advertising. It is your chance to reach low information voters. It is your chance to persuade people and, and mobilize. And, you know, talking about the, the cool stuff that happens to get people out to vote and all that, that's expensive too. But the, the money and effort that goes into advertising is so overwhelming on a campaign, you can't get it wrong. And when I look at you know each of the parties this time, there's some stuff I, I like, and we you know we definitely got into it in the, in the podcast and, and didn't. I think one of the struggles for each of the parties is none of them had something so big or so interesting going on that they really punched through, and took it from you know where they were to a whole higher level. You know when you look at the the parties itself, I mean I think the. The conservatives get some, they definitely get an award for uh, a focus and a determination. I mean, they never veered from an affordability script the entire campaign. Message, every, message every, discipline. Every ad hit on the same themes. And that is hard to do because when you get distracted, you come up with theories and ideas. And if we only do this, maybe it'll move the needle. Can I stop you right there, Dennis, though, for yeah. a second? Because you early in this campaign, um, and if anybody hasn't read it, literally go back and still read it. A, a brilliant thread on Twitter about what affordability actually meant and where the affordability emotional nexus was with people. And we agreed yeah. on the podcast today that nobody found that sweet spot in this yeah. campaign. Do you yeah. want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, you know, we live in a world where there's a polling question I love. You ask people, you know, do you think you'll be better off than your, your parents' generation? And this is the first group out there who thinks they won't do as well as the generation before them. I mean, this is an existential thing in our in our society. And I think sometimes this gets mixed up in, in dollars and cents. Well, if only I had, you know, 50 bucks extra a month or my cell phone bill was cheaper or other things, I'd be better off. I think it's a lot bigger than that. This is a group of people who want the bigger home. They want to be able to take they want to be able to take their kids to Disneyland for a vacation. They want to do bigger things. And it's not just I can't get by this week. It's I want a better life and it's not quite there I for me. And, and I think you see that in Toronto a lot with housing, for example. And people don't say housing affordability. It's you got people who are looking at a million and a half dollar home as a starter home and right. they're saying that's not available to me. And there's an aspirational element to this. And I think that none of the parties has fully tapped into that. We talked about an ad today, the final conservative ad, I think, started hitting at that. But you know, we've got sort of four or five days left. So I think that was, that was a bit of a miss for me in the campaign. 
appears to me that the negative ads in this campaign from any of the parties are not as negative as negative ads have been have there in the been past. Any? Well, not really. Uh, really, no. Uh, I mean, the Conservatives have done some stuff. Well, both parties have done some stuff uh, on social media. But on television, it's been contrast more than it's been yeah. hard-hitting attacks. David? Yeah. Yeah, it's been it's been pretty rational. I mean, the the conservatives just came out with uh, what I would call a ledger versus ledger ad. Trudeau will cost you more. Conservatives will put more money in your pocket. Very rational um, contrast. Trudeau's been hacking, you know, banging away at uh, you know a progressive set of ideas versus ideas that he claims will take the country backward. It's all been, as I say, just in in terms of all of the ads, really rational. Hasn't laddered up to anything. Uh, really uh, emotionally uh, affecting. Yeah. And why? What, yeah. Why? And, and, and I want to ask, ask you a question. Why? Because I understand, David, you you offered an explanation for why the Liberals won't do that, which I think, by the way, is a mistake. Like, I think there should have been photographs on my television while I was watching hockey and football in the last weekend of Doug Ford and Andrew Shearer, and it should have said, they'll, they'll, they'll wreck your lives, mm -hmm. right? Uh, that's what Jenny I was the liberal ad should have been. Jenny was looking for that with, ad. With right. evidence. I was. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I don't even get, fuck the evidence. They just, they're going to wreck your life. No, you okay? can't, you, you can't yeah. fuck the evidence. Okay. The evidence counts. There's plenty of evidence. So, um. <laughs> like soldiers in your streets. The yeah, right. Like, 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 if you like, over, if you over like, egg. Like, no moss. If, no moss. Like, no no moss. Jenny's, no. Jenny's right. If you, <laughs> if you over, if you over egg the evidence, it will not work. It's got to be believable. I know that ad tested, that ad tested through the roof, you know, that thing would have soared. So I understand on David's explanation um, tells me why the liberals didn't go there. Why didn't why didn't the conservatives? You know, I think for you know, so for the liberals, I agree. It's just the the sunny ways, like they're they're stuck in that that matrix. For conservatives, I think there's a there's a positive to the reason they didn't. They were so focused on affordability and cost of living, and the fact that a Trudeau government will cost you more. The proof points that you might have been looking for, or thinking that why weren't they in ads? Whether it's some of the SNC Lavalin, whether it's you know black or brown face, whether it's other other things that would feature in a traditional attack ad, the treatment of Jody Wilson Raybould. I think these things are they're interesting points, and I think there may be even points that would win voters on the most level. But affordability ad, you could have picked up on your theme. You could have said, you could have said, you know, you're falling behind. You're going to have to downsize your life as a 905er, and it's shitty. Yeah. Can't heat your house. No, and I, and I think if you take a look at the whole set, and I'm obviously not, you know, I haven't been involved, so it's, it's you know, great questions for the folks who are working on them, but I think the, the desire to be so focused on that, this will cost you this, will save you that, it puts you in a box. And, you know, we'll see an election day, maybe it was brilliant, we'll all be here saying, you know what, they were so focused on it that, that that worked. I do think this emotional connection that we've, you know, we've talked a lot on the podcast, you know, you've seen a ton of, like, dealership ads, like dealership car ads, this election campaign, you haven't seen automotive brand advertising. I love that. And I think that's, you know, it's David's line, and I think it's a, it's a great way to describe a lot of what we saw. But, but just one sec, what was, if, what was the Hazel ad in 2015, if not a closing week negative ad? It was cloaked. You, it was a great ad. But yeah. cloaked, cloaked in a woman you could believe, but who also, you know, who also touched on issues like um, uh, the empowerment of seniors and did it in a way that made you smile, mm -hmm. but was entirely a negative ad because it basically Completely. said Harper was lying. Right. Yeah. So was why, haven't they, why haven't they been able to achieve something like that this time around? I don't know. But I also presume that the advertising has a fair bit to do with why the campaign hasn't crystallized around an idea or a choice, because it's often the advertising that performs that function. But you have to get to an emotional level in which to do that. That's the 1988 border erasing liberal ad, or some of the stuff we ran against Mr. Harper in, in uh, 2004. Those Is that a different era? Like, I mean, you know, so I'm constantly confronted with people who tell me I'm a dinosaur, and they say, yeah, you don't understand it. Like, it's all about clicks and digital, and so uh, it's like yeah. if you care about this, then you follow that trail and whatever, and so you don't understand. There is no mass media. No, you can still do it. You can still do it. We put an anti-Ford ad on TV at the beginning of the uh, last provincial campaign, and it was tremendously successful at hurting Ford, just not in our favor. It moved all the votes to the NDP. <laughs> put us out of the campaign immediately. Right. <laughs> my first strategic <laughs> we are called strategists. My first, <laughs> my first strategic decision ended the liberal campaign. Uh, so Jenny, you're the ground game person. 
And in my view, the Conservatives are 100% about ground game right now. There are no... Avail- All the campaign should be 100% by gra- about ground game. Well, not really. Not really. The Liberals are still in a fight for votes with the NDP okay, and but the that's, Greens. Okay, but they've got to, to get their votes. With the but block. that's the ground game. It's They've got to get their votes out. They if do. They're, they're still actually competing for new votes. They're fighting the NDP but, for votes. Let me just finish. Let me just finish. The Conservatives... <laughs> all right. All right. Conservatives are not fighting for votes anymore. There are no swing votes between the Conservatives and anybody else. So the Conservatives are entirely focused, I presume, on getting their vote out. What kind of advertising supports that initiative? You can now take issue with any of my assumptions. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Listen, I actually think for the most part, uh, there is no advertising right now that's going to change anything. Like, there is, it is, it is, for the most part, it's done. Like, it is now 100%. There is no more votes you're going to ID. There is no more, like, you can be lucky if, if people are swinging back and forth. Um, you know, putting their car keys in a bowl and 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 hoping to uh, to, to 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 change at the end of the day, but uh, it's it's not it's it's. Did this turn into a key party? <laughs> right, that was a weird. Into a key party. That was a strange <laughs> analogy, wasn't it? Uh, is everybody here in the lifestyle? <laughs> I mean, uh... <laughs> The doors lock at 10, in case you're wondering. And then it gets weird. <laughs> Welcome to the Canadian Club. Um, but no, it's, it's, I actually think for the most part, most, most votes are solidified. There's almost no, uh, there, is, there is almost no opportunity at this point. And you point. don't want air cover for get, it, get out the vote. You don't need air cover to get out the vote. I, I, I don't think, like, but sure but it's not going to happen on this campaign like i guess for me i'd be looking at it as someone getting out the vote that it's not going to happen it's not like you guys have great ads we have great ads the ndp is great ads it's just it's not happening so right now you are looking at the you know if you're in a riding and you've got 10,000 identified supporters you should have more you should have more than that but if you have 10,000 identified supporters you're figuring out what went out at the advance polls and how the fuck you're going to drag them out on monday uh, Monday to vote. There's really not, it's, it's really that simple. All the other mechanics and the kind of sexy stuff that we're talking about, it's done. It is a matter of like knocking on doors and making phone calls and all that kind of stuff right now. So the time of the campaign when Reed goes drinking. He, he Scott can drink now. Yeah, that's right. Scott, yeah, well, Scott, that's Scott, not a, that's Scott not, can now drink. Okay. It's so not a wise way to characterize it. This is the point at the night at which the professionals who run the Canadian club tell us that you're bored. And so uh, we must wrap up at this time, but we'll wrap up this part of it. Now we're going to open the floor to questions, okay. comments, uh, any observations people uh, want to make. You know, if we were organizers, we would have seated the question period because you know, nobody ever wants to get up first. You have to get some. Uh, yeah, there would be a 17 year old son who would look remarkably like me. <laughs> <laughs> Dear not dad, what are the most amazing accomplishments of your political life? So, I, I have a question. I have a question. Um, Maxime Bernier, not a word on him, nothing on the impact on the conservative vote. Is he a non-factor in this? You guys did not even mention him. Uh, no, I don't think he's a non-factor. I think uh, that Max uh, might have a very hard time winning seats, but he could easily uh, prevent, uh, prevent people, uh, and by people I mean conservatives, um, from, uh, uh, he could be a spoiler. Uh, if you look, uh, he, he is polling anywhere to two to three percent in Ontario ridings. If we're looking at 905 seats, uh, that are close, uh, they could come down to two or three percent, so he could be a spoiler. If you look at Jagmeet Singh's by-election in Burnaby South, the, uh, People's Party got 11 percent of the vote in that riding. So, yeah. Uh, even if, if, if in British Columbia or different ridings, uh, he gets half of that, it doesn't, me- it doesn't mean that he will win, but Max could be, uh, Max and the People's Party could be a spoiler. And in terms for his campaign, he is running against another Maxime Bernier for the, for the Rhinoceros Party, <laughs> named Maxime Bernier. Um, but keep in mind, in terms of la- the, the name recognition in the Bose, his dad ran as an independent, the king of the Bose. That's why Max has the nickname the, the Prince of the Bose. Um, makes sense. It's all... Um, uh, Dauphin, and, I think they yeah, say. Uh, he, uh, 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 Bernier's dad uh, won uh, as an independent in the 1993 right. election, and then I right. believe Crutchin appointed him as the ambassador to Haiti. 
Really? Yeah. Ambassador to what? Haiti. Haiti. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Where they speak French, in case you're not. Uh, can I? I just think this, and I've said it since the beginning of the podcast. I think that he will uncomfortably outpull his numbers. He'll outperform his polls. He will. There's a hidden Bernier vote. I hidden think that's true. Vote. And I think we'll find it particularly and uncomfortably, surprisingly, in British Columbia. Um, I think we'll see that he will outpull his vote. His uh, he will outperform his poll, um, but I think he'll lose his own writing for all those reasons. Mm. And the BQ surge. I, I do think the one question on Bernier is when he's you know whether he pulls two or five percent in the riding. Are those traditional non-voters who get motivated to come out for him, or yeah. are they people who traditionally vote conservative and switch? And I'm you know depending on the area, I think you're onto something in BC for sure. But I do think there are, is an element of people who would not normally vote that come out and vote for him. It's not a pure robbing from the. Right. By the way, he's run a shit campaign, eh? Like he should be doing better. I know he's a racist and a horrible person and all that sort of shit, <laughs> but he should have done better. Why? He, How, what, what should he have done? Oh, 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 hey. <laughs> well, we're not, you know. Uh, well, I mean, I. That's true. I'm going to choose not to respond to that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I Jenny made that point earlier. <laughs> <laughs> All right, who's got a question? How about who's Obama? Got a question out there, comment, anything. So, uh, something that was touched on a bit earlier tonight was uh, the coalition talk. And um, we've seen a bit of that coming from the NDP, um, some anti coalition uh, memes and whatnot coming from the conservatives. Any thoughts on how this could play out either this week or post-election? I'll let these guys go. They have a much different opinion than me. Well, then we should all go. <laughs> but I'll go first. Okay? Uh, I think that, um, I think that uh, Singh made a mistake talking about coalitions because it takes us down a rabbit hole of discussing parliamentary configurations and whether what the conventions are, et cetera. I think, though, that... Uh, the essential idea behind what he was saying, and he's, I think, trying to get back there, was quite clever. So what happens at the end of every campaign is that the Liberals apply vote pressure on the votes to the left of them, whether it's the NDP or the Greens, to turn away from that party and come vote for the Liberal Party to stop the dangerous Conservatives um, from taking office. And when the NDP are running, as Jack Layton always did, for instance, avowedly to be prime minister, and that's what they insist on right to the last day that they're running for prime minister, they're very vulnerable to that strategic vote pressure. And they can lose a lot of votes in the last week of the campaign as people get practical about what the outcome is going to be. So I think that Singh actually addressing that head on and saying, you do not need to worry about a conservative government if I'm elected or by voting NDP. We're as opposed to the conservatives as you are. And implicitly, we're going to make sure that there's a liberal government after this election, uh, whether you vote, for, if, even if you vote for us. And so that, I think, for people who were saying, I want to vote NDP, but I really don't want Sheer, that's a comforting message, and I think it was well delivered. You really hear me. Um, I agree with all that. I'm going to skip forward. I think the interest, isn't the most interesting thing to talk about is what if Trudeau doesn't win a plurality of seats, but is still the prime minister, right? You know, like, I mean, you know, so from my perspective, I think that the coalition talk has started, it, it lit the match on talking about minority scenarios. And I agree with the, all, everything that David said. He did it clumsily in a way that might have been really, really unfortunate for him. Because if he had just said, if Singh had just said, this is all about stopping Shear from being prime minister, and I'm for that. Don't worry about it. You can vote NDP, and there's uh, no risk of that. He might have been in an okay place. Coalition started talking about, like, who's going to is somebody going to be forming this government? But what if? This is the great fun thing four days from outside of this election result. What if Trudeau is not his dad in 1972? What if he doesn't win by one seat? What if he loses by one seat? Well, he stays on. He to, stays to no on. Brainer. So no you brainer. and I, no, but no, you, you and I have had this argument. So I agree with that. 
I agree with that. That's you don't where give up, you don't give up power lightly. You think oh. they don't going give up power long that's hard where, before you no, walk but Jenny, into the before, like, So let's just chart out the two paths, right? So the one path is there's no way, as David says, which I agree with ultimately. You don't give up power. You don't give up power. That's a cracker thing to do. And you do technically, you're still the prime minister, and under the parliamentary code, you get to be the sitting prime minister. But there's going to be a 19 or a, 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 a 2008 type argument in the country about whether or not the guy who comes first gets to get first crack at forming government. And there's going to be all this. And after SNC Lavalin and after blackface, it's going to further diminish the brand and bruise the brand of Trudeau when he looks like he's saying, hang on. I agree with you. Ultimately, you go, hey, you know what? Fuck this noise. I am still the prime minister, and I've got to hang on, and I can form and command a majority. I but Sheer, okay. it would be interesting if Sheer... Jump in, Jen. What happens? What happens? Now, what happens is whoever wins the most seats is going to be prime minister. Like That's what, not what what's going to happen. <laughs> Unless it's a liberal outcome. No. I know you hate that answer, but that is the honest why would that, answer. Why would that be the answer? Well, the answer is because uh, there has been no, the only reason we're all entertaining this is because this election has been so fucking boring that we are sitting with four days left to go that we're, we're inventing coalition, uh, uh, we're invi inventing something to talk about. At the end of the day, It's Justin, a cool thing to talk about. <laughs> Well, listen, I, I, we lived through coalition stuff, and uh, it, it, at the end Tried of the one, fought one. Won one. Yeah. 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 Um, My understanding <laughs> is that Harper thought he was done on the day of the press conference, and he had to be convinced uh, no. that he had when room Jill to du fight. When Jill Duceppe's, Duceppe stood up with uh, Stephen Dion and Jack Layton, I can tell you uh, Stephen Harper did not think he was done that day. No, I bet that's right. I, I bet that's right, but I don't think it's. I don't think it's. I don't think it's too. So, anyways, all oh, this yeah. to say, if I can just say something, you can. Thank you. No, you can't. <laughs> At the end of the day, uh, Trudeau has not seriously entertained any talk of a coalition. He has been very vague on it. Uh, Singh has done what he has done on every major issue from. Uh, the religious symbols Ill, uh, bill on uh, on Bill 21 to this, he has gone back and forth uh, right. in terms. Because why would Jagmeet Singh want to be in a coalition with Justin Trudeau, but a guy who's going he wants to get to be. a guy? But that's what you're saying. So, no, you know, you and I have had this argument before. Oh There's my a goodness! Distinction between a coalition and a minority. No, no you're yes. Not, oh a my coalition government is 1914 under yeah, because you Gordon when saying, you have. You know, um, oh multiple parties God. in the you cabinet. Guys but you made the example of 2004. You guys had the most seats. So Jack Layton propping you up was propping up Paul Martin with the most seats. Paul Martin was still prime minister. He was fucking us day by day. And, <laughs> but Paul Martin for a year and a half before we won was still prime minister. But that's a minority Sorry, Jenny, situation. you're right. It would be unusual, and it's not a direct comparison so what to I'm 2004. Exactly. That's right. For so what I'm saying is there is no interest for anyone. Trudeau has not talked about it, and Jagmeet Singh, why would he? The Liberals are going to have an SNC investigation. Uh, they're going to have an SNC investigation. He's a t two of them. Thank you very much. Why from, the in, from the insurance bureau. I didn't even understand that. Day. Why? Why does the bureau? Why? Why do the insurers think there would be two? <laughs> no, but there's been there's been, he's been dinged by the ethics commissioner uh, okay. twice. Uh, he he has Singh has been campaigning against him the entire campaign. What is in Jagmeet Singh's interest to prop up Justin Trudeau to I'll be tell prime you, minister? I'll tell you there is there is none. Uh, that's, that's not true. I'll tell you exactly what it is. And no, it's it's it's, it's, it's it's in the Liberals' interest for Jagmeet Singh to do that. No, it's clearly in his I, interest. <laughs> Could I go? Uh, I think that there's something that's fundamentally different about this, and it relates to the single biggest mistake the Conservative Party made in this election campaign, and that is not to have a reasonable climate change plan, not to have any serious attempt at tackling climate change. Oh, and my God. In fact, in fact, to basically give the finger to people who care about climate change by announcing highway expansion on the day of the climate march. 
Um, da and I think that David three Hurley is uh, is campaigning now to replace Justin Trudeau as leader of the Liberal Party. Well, hey. Um, the podcast camaraderie <laughs> is breaking down here in the final few days. <laughs> it's not partisanship. It's I kind of personal, actually. Shut up! I actually didn't say that to make a political speech. I actually said to try to set this up, which is that I believe that the climate change forward coalition uh, that includes the Bloc, the Liberals, the NDP, and the Greens will not allow the Conservatives to form government and right. spend four years not doing anything about climate change. That will both bind the coalition and legitimize the coalition in the public. Nothing legitimizes it by having the separatist bloc Quebecois. That will, that will be the, a gift to Andrew Scheer if that's actually what happens. Probably, probably. You know, I do think just one, in, one point here. If you look at the public, not that engaged in this election, I think we've all sort of agreed on that in, in various levels. Public opinion is what changed in 2008. It wasn't procedure, it wasn't all these other things. The public shifted against the, the coalition. And so when you look at this election, I think you, you can have a scenario where the public, they vote for whoever won, and, and we're talking about most seats. What if Sheer wins the, the, the most votes as well, which I think is a very real possibility in addition to most seats. And so there's sort of some basic fairness issues that come at play with the public. They suddenly wake up, say, well, yeah, we sort of weren't paying attention. Whoa, the winner didn't win. Now, not saying that's going to happen, but I, I wouldn't discount the public opinion, and I wouldn't discount Alberta in particular being so outraged at a level I don't think we can quite understand here in Toronto at an outcome like that. Well, I'm not saying it won't be. I don't know. I won't say it won't be divisive, Dennis, because you're right. The third of the country that voted Conservative will be outraged if they win seats and votes and don't form the government. And in parts of the country, that will be a huge regional issue. But the 70% of the people who voted against the Conservatives will not be troubled by it at all. That's exactly what I mean. Right. And by the way, Donald Trump has <laughs> 3 million oh fewer votes. <laughs> no, but I mean, if we're going to make that the standard, then you're going to get that kind of pissy match. Like, I mean, seriously, I, and I'm not, I'm not, but you're going to get into that kind of pissing match, <laughs> right? If you're going to say, well, it's all about popular vote, you're going to go, well, Jesus Christ, that obviously isn't the standard otherwise. We'd have a different president. We have a question at the back yes. from the owner. Yes, right, right here, please actually. give us a question. Yes, right here, actually. Uh, big fan of the podcast, and even if it's disintegrating before our very eyes. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, the glare of the lights. You, you've all uh, advised uh, powerful people, uh, and I want to ask a, a counterfactual. If you were advising uh, young MP Justin Trudeau, who was interested in running for the leadership of the Liberal Party, and he came to you and he said, he had this black and brown faced stuff in his past, and uh, um, uh, it, it, there were photos, there was probably video, plenty of uh, people saw him do it, uh, and he now knew it was wrong, and he also knew that it would run exactly counter to the kind of brand that he wanted to build. Mm -hmm. What would your advice to him be? I always assume that everything becomes public, that everything comes out. I always assume that no matter how awful it is, it will be better on your terms than any other terms. So if I was in the position I've held with the politicians I had advised, the first second I knew about that, I would have been talking about methods of getting that out into the public domain on our terms. I know three things about you, David, that the people here do not. <laughs> <laughs> So be careful if you want to elevate this to a point of principle. Well, it's, uh, I, I assume we're talking about young Justin Trudeau, f first elected in the riding of, uh, of Papineau. And as my friend Scott uh, uh, rightly said on a podcast a couple weeks ago, that uh, a issues management strategy uh, is one is actually not doing anything. Uh, I think that probably uh, for the last 11 years, uh, that strategy has worked well for Justin Trudeau, and uh, I can't fault him in pro probably using that issues management strategy. He got through one, two, three elections, one leadership race. Uh, he was prime minister for four years, and it never came out. And I know this is a horrifying answer to people. Um, but to just to pile on to what Jenny said, um, we're also, um, what are we, like 39 days to a 42 day campaign? And it appears to not have been determinative in this campaign. No, so, no, no um, but I don't think you're right. 
we talked earlier. I think it knocked the liberals right off their game. I think it totally yeah, it, disrupted it's had, their it's strategy. It's had indirect impacts. Right. But I, it hasn't elect it. It if, if electorally, what it will have done is actually uh, have made them hesitant from what I talked about earlier in terms of the last week that they've had no negative ads. But it actually electorally has not has not hurt them. And I hate to say this because I think it's. I, I am like aghast by the whole thing. I was like stunned, and I, I know I said it at the time on our podcast in the media. If it had been a candidate for any party under any circumstance, uh, they would have been removed as a candidate, and their entire careers politically would have been yeah. done. Like not even like it wouldn't have even been. Uh, uh, it wouldn't have even been yep. discussed. I wrote that also in the Globe Mail. I mean, I but yeah. there's if you want to be really. Uh, bloodless about it from an uh, issues management perspective, which I think is the way you pose the question. There's an X and Y axis. And the X axis is how bad is this? And the Y axis is how likely is it to come out? And you have to, you have to <laughs> sort of put those things together and go, well. Are you going to explain this to us mathematically, how this works? But seriously, but seriously, like, I mean. To no. Scott's point, uh, it coming out in the campaign made it more political than it probably would have if it had come out in a non-campaign. And so I actually heard from people that were working on liberal campaigns in the suburbs of the 416, so the Scarboroughs, Etobicoes, what have you, was it was actually became more of a, I hate to use it, but a galvanizing issue for liberals that are like, okay, well, our guys... My God, you're back. going full Judy Scrow on us. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. But it was it it actually like in it it brought liberals into campaign offices feeling that that their uh, their guy was was under attack. I think it's a gasp, but that's I heard that from more than one person. Right, I always think it's way worse when you get busted on something and then totally. when you came clean. Uh, yes. Okay, so you guys have had a podcast where you called this the Seinfeld election, right? So this is an election about nothing. If you look at the polls, the leaders are all negatively pulling behind their party, right? So Is that right? I, I, I think there's even or behind. Know, Nobody's ahead. Yeah, there, there, there's generally we're not talking about issues like this has been maybe the worst election in, of all time um, in terms of this being like a substantive <laughs> election. Um, and so generally, my view is that tends to favor the incumbent. All the big surge of votes. So Jenny can talk about this in more detail because I was. Part of it, but you know, Harper sort of held his own on his votes in the last election. But Trudeau got a whole bunch of new voters <laughs> out. We got 5.6 million votes. Last yeah. Election. So, so in an election about Not nothing, where the leaders are all generally viewed as shit um, behind their party, um, you you would tend to see, although that might favor the incumbent, um, you know, you would tend to see a reduction of all those people who came out to vote for Trudeau in the last election. Um, I'd like to know if all that's true, which there seems to be some consensus about, why the big turnout in advance voting polls? That's the part I can't understand. If, you know, this favors the incumbent, it's election about nothing, no one really likes the leaders, people are plugging their nose in voting, why was there record turnout at the advance polls? I, I actually think it could be uh, as simple as it was easy to vote in the advance polls. Um, I think that... Uh, the extra, the four days over Thanksgiving, I think there were people that, um, outside of Atlantic Canada, Monday is a stat holiday for all of us, um, and uh, most people do their turkey on Sundays, and I think a lot of people just uh, decided uh, to vote there. In terms of the, uh, I, so, uh, so I don't know. It's actually been funny. I've been waiting for the riding by riding results to be uh, released by Elections Canada, because I'm a bit of a nerd that way. Um, to actually see uh, what the riding by riding turnouts are. Uh, one of the things, though, about the 2.5 million new voters that voted in the last election, which the Liberals, uh, uh, for the most part, I think, benefited from, the difference between, I think, the Liberals and us, if you're looking at it from a data point of view, is uh, the Liberals actually have, they have information on those 2.5 million voters because they've been doing what we did for years, which is you are regularly communicating with those people. So you are uh, talking to them through uh, phone calls from the party, surveys from MP offices, uh, door knocking, uh, what have you. So they actually have 2.5 million people in their 
database in their party's electoral database that we don't have. I assume the Conservatives, uh, uh, if they had 2.5 million people, which we would have identified as non-supporters, we just stop talking to those people. Like if they were what we would call um, uh, uh, lifetime unknowns and current non-supporters, uh, those people are, pe are, are people we never would have communicated. So there is a possibility that we are all underestimating the vote uh, that the Liberal Party has actually gotten out because they are, there are 2.5 million new voters who we know might uh, be upset that uh, proportional representation didn't go through or they feel that like the province has have fucked up cannabis legalization, but we don't have any information on them. The only people that could possibly have information on them is the Liberal Party of Canada. So that could actually speak to an increased uh, uh, increase as well. But I think the only that's the most optimistic thing about the Liberals I've heard in a while. I no kidding. Me a, I'm like, I, 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 gave me a was I supposed to say that? I'm like, wow. Lynette, I would be very surprised if, despite the despite the advanced polls if the turnout wasn't below what it was in 2015, and especially among that youth cohort, uh, the evidence even before blackface was that they were dispersed among all the parties in relatively equal numbers and not terribly motivated. So I don't expect nearly the same kind of turnout, and there almost never is for an incumbent. Um, but once someone Obama voted, didn't get the same youth vote in 2012 that he got in 2008, it's really hard. But once someone has voted, they are more likely to vote again. So there were 2.5 million new voters that voted in uh, 2015. They are more apt to go out and vote in, um, uh, in 2019. Great. One last question we're allowed. Is it Ted Gretzner there at the back? Yeah. Well, the all, owner of the pilot, ladies and gentlemen. Happy. Ted Gretzner. Woo! Woo! Our host. So first of all, thanks everyone for coming to the pilot. We appreciate uh, everyone being here. This has been a fun night. So. The, I, have, I hate questions that have a preface, but I have to preface this. So I spend a lot of time in Alberta in my job, and I, I work in the oil and gas business, and I was out there last week, and the prevailing mood was, it doesn't matter who wins because we're screwed anyway. Yeah. That their view was, even if Scheer wins, he's going to owe Quebec, or he's going to owe Ontario, and he's going to have to pay more attention to where the votes are, where the seats are, than them. So. Past elections, now Tuesday morning, your guy was the, was the Prime Minister, or Elizabeth May's team, you're the Prime Minister. How do you start to put stuff back together? Because the guy, the one fellow who's a deep conservative in Alberta told me last week, he said, we see more alignment with the BQ than we do with any other party. Mm. So how do you start to put stuff back together? Well, the Liberal Party knows exactly what to do in a situation like this, and yeah. that is from Saskatchewan and Alberta and Manitoba, you put senators in the cabinet. Yeah. And yeah. that immediately bonds you to that community and you're uh, <laughs> on the way back politically. Uh, no, that's going to be, I mean, the national unity implications of this election are, are uh, not sufficiently talked about. Uh, it is in, in the aftermath. I think it's going to be a big issue, and, and not in Quebec, but in, in the prairies. I, I think that the Quebec bloc, Quebec law phenomenon is not a separatist phenomenon. I know the Federalists always say that, but in this case, I think it is generally true uh, that it is an expression of Francophone desire to tell English Canadians to mind their fucking business when it comes to uh, Quebec culture. Um, so I don't think it's about separatism, but I think that, um, I think that the reality, it isn't just the result of this election campaign, is that Alberta and, Brit and Saskatchewan are on a path of collision with the rest of the country. Yeah. Um, and that the rest of the country is favoring a set of policies that will diminish the economic success of those provinces. And they're being asked to just accept that. And they don't appear like they're interested in just accepting that. So I think we're in for some tough times. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, we. we uh uh, I we speak to a lot of I speak to a lot of people uh, in Alberta and uh, there's always been rumblings of people in Alberta not being happy but over the last few years uh, it's a it's a different uh, it's a different level of uh, unhappiness uh, it's people that uh, I'm I'm from I'm from the reform side of our party um, uh, and uh, they, these are people that you know, would have voted for Joe Clark in the 2000 election uh, when he was running in Calgary Centre, who are now openly talking about separation. So it is a, it's a much different dynamic, whether it's Andrew Scheer, who might be a little bit more poised, in a better position to deal with it, being a, a Prairie representative and having, you know, the majority of the 34 Didn't look good in that Hamilton Tiger Cat shirt <laughs> I put on Twitter the other day. 
<laughs> I, I do think, you know, one, one interesting point is Kenny has promised a referendum on equalization. And, you know, you think a referendum might be an escape valve, but there's no escape valve there. It's impossible to imagine what, right. you know, what happens yeah. after that. And so what I'm looking for, at least in, in Alberta and partly Saskatchewan, is where is that escape valve? Where is that, that, you know, that way to let out some of that steam? And it's not obvious what it's going to be in the short term. David, Scott, anything to wrap up here on this question before we... Call it a thing. I, I would just uh, I would amplify uh, Dennis's point that I think that that um, this issue is going to get more, not less, complicated, and we are, as lots of people are going to say on uh, Monday night, a lot more like 1972 to 1979 uh, that we've been in a long time. We're going to end up in a minority situation. We're going to end up with a Trudeau, and we're going to end up with a lot of agreed people in Western Canada. Uh, well, actually, I was just because I know that we're ending things now. We're kind of getting the hook. And I just wanted to uh, say uh, uh, thank you to David because without David, no kidding, eh? we wouldn't. The Hurley Burley here. is named Hurley. We know Hurley Burley. And I have to say, it, is, it has been phenomenal to get to know you, to get to know Scott to do this. It's been the most fun I've had in this campaign, so I'm being very selfish with this, but I just want to thank you because you brought all these people out, and uh, uh, it has been a great thing for this election. So thank you very much. Thank you. I love this group of people. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> the Hurley Burley Podcast. David Hurley, Jenny Burns, Scott Reed, David Rosenberg, Dennis Matthews. How would everyone feel if we had a post-election event. Would people come out? All right, we're gonna work on a post-election. How do you guys feel about that? Is that good? So stay tuned, everyone, we'll, uh, and we'll see you back then. But I want to admit that you've set the bar very high for fun, and thank you very much for making election 43 actually exciting. So thank you very much. Thank you to IBC, the Insurance Bureau, and thank you to all of you for coming. We'll see you again soon.